Radio York. Um, he's he worked as a video journalist for four years uh, before becoming the Look North West Yorkshire reporter. And now he's often seen on your your tea, as he is one of the key co-presenters of the Look North Fixture TV programme. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Phil Bodman. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak during uh, Journalism Week. It's a, a privilege to be here. As um, Sarah mentioned, uh, Harry opened uh, the event on uh, Monday, and I, I went to football with Harry on uh, Saturday afternoon. He said he was coming here to talk, and that he said that they were looking for a keynote speaker. So he, he didn't know what he was doing there as a keynote speaker. I jest, of course, because Harry's quite self-deprecating. Similarly, uh, I feel a bit like the uh, hind legs of the pantomime horse, sort of bringing up the rear. But um, it's, uh, it's lovely to be here, Harry opening the event, and I know you've had some really very eloquent speakers this week to talk to you about uh, Journalism Week and uh, what journalism means and how sort of to get a, a career in it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, never heard of me, and frankly, don't give a damn, uh, my name's Phil Bodmer. Uh, I work, as uh, Sarah said, as a, a broadcast, senior broadcast journalist uh, nowadays. Um, I've lived in Yorkshire for the best part of 30 years. I worked for Look North for 21 years. Um, when I was invited here, I, I think somebody may have been laboring under some kind of misapprehension. I might have something vaguely interesting to say. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, but you'll discover as uh, we go on. Um, I've been very lucky, to be honest, uh, in my career, and it's really about having opportunities and, I suppose, really taking those opportunities. Um, you can have all the qualifications in the world, uh, you can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't get a lucky break, you won't get very far. So you need really a, a combination of, of everything, really, and you need a, a certain helping of hard work as well, because, as you'll know and you'll be fully aware, the industry is supremely competitive uh, these days because there's many more formalised routes into journalism. When I started, it was anything but. Um, people often say, how did you end up getting a job presenting on Look North? Um, the truth is, it's more by accident than design. And uh, I know that, that may sound rather strange, but it is true, uh, as you'll discover. Um, my main role at Look North is something called a senior broadcast journalist. That means I work mainly as a reporter with a crew, and I really work uh, on the day. Uh, so that means I'm given a story rather than having to look for a story. However, having said that, um, it's incumbent on all of us to try and bring original stories in because that is the lifeblood of uh, television and regional journalism. Um, I also get the opportunity uh, to cover for Harry uh, when Harry's off, and uh, that is a great privilege uh, and a great honour to be able to do that, uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, but my day job is really working as uh, the West Yorkshire reporter, although that's a nominal title because we tend to sort of cross boundaries. This week, for instance, I've been working uh, in Sheffield, actually in radio, so I've, I've not done any TV this. Well, I have done TV. I did uh, last night's Look North, or the night before last Look North. It's all merges into a blur now. But uh, all this week, I've worked on Roni Robinson's 10 to 1 mid-morning programme on BBC Radio Sheffield, which is predominantly a mix of music and uh, interspersed with interviews. Anything really ranging from, we did a subject on abortion, uh, which was quite heavy and in-depth, uh, to wolf whistling, which is the opposite end of the spectrum. But it's all about range, I suppose, and uh, it's been quite an experience to do that. I, I did begin in radio, so it's quite familiar uh, ground to me. Um, what I want to do uh, really is show some DVDs, show some of my work, and just give you some examples of the kind of work I've done. Um, as I say, my, my main job really is not the presenter, that's Harry's job. My job is as one of the North's reporters. So there are occasions when I report and present combined and do both on the same day. So I'll just run one of these videos by you. So if you haven't seen my stuff, here's a chance to uh, have a look and see uh, what it looks like. If I can get the DVD to work, we'll be in business. <laughs> Good evening tonight. The fly tipping branded a health hazard as well as a blight on the landscape. Rotting food, household waste and soiled nappies have been dumped alongside old settees in Goldthorpe in South Yorkshire. 
Residents on Railway View say the stench from fly-tipped waste is antisocial and is attracting vermin to the area. Barnsley Council estimates it could take weeks to clear and cost up to £90,000. A filthy pile of rotting, fly-infested household waste. This could be a typical council-controlled rubbish dump, but it's not. In fact, this stinking litter-strewn embankment is just a few metres away from family homes and a school in the former South Yorkshire mining village of Goldthorpe. Despite the threat of up to five years in prison and unlimited fines for fly tipping, that doesn't seem to have put people off using this old railway cutting as an unofficial dumping ground for their household waste. The problem, according to people who live nearby, comes from fly tipping. That's dumping waste illegally instead of taking it to an authorised rubbish site. People we spoke to were nervous to appear on camera for fear of being targeted by fly tippers. They believe it's become so bad, it now poses a risk to public health. I get rats in the garden. I've got three cats. They bring rats in. People come during day, night, and just throw it off at banks. And if you complain, what reaction do you get? A lot. Name calling. Do you blame the council or do you blame local people? Other people no, living I blame here dumping council it. and people. Black sacks getting slung down, bankings, dirty nappies, any sort of rubbish, mattresses, anything. Barnsley Council says it's working to find a permanent solution to the problem. You're looking at eight five, ninety thousand pounds a time when we're clearing this up. It's not acceptable, and it's something that we we really are relying on the public of Goldthorpe and people that live around there to tell us who's doing it, uh, tell us when it's happening, see if we can really get hold of, of who's responsible for this and deal with it. Well, among some of the items we've found here are dirty nappies, broken bottles, and even old pieces of household furniture. The thing is, though, there's a, a quite a strong smell coming from this rotten waste and lots of flies everywhere. Not to mention, of course, the problem caused by rats. Residents are now calling for the cutting to be cleared once and for all and properly fenced off. They fear while ever the fly tipping is allowed to continue, there's an increasing risk to public health. Well, in this case, the council's... Um, uh, and, and on the day story. Uh, uh, the thing about that, though, is it's, I mentioned original journal journalism. That was a story which I uh, came across. Uh, I was driving back from South Yorkshire. And I stopped off at an Asda store in this village of Goldthorpe. It's a former, former mining community in South Yorkshire, um, which lost its pit um, uh, during the aftermath of the pit closure program in the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s. And uh, it really didn't have much in the way of employment opportunities for... Um, young people and it fell really into de decline and disrepair and I happened to uh, I was I parked my car up because the Asda car park was full I parked it on a side street and as I was walking by I put my head over a railway parapet and I saw all the detritus below and I, and I took a photo with my iPhone and I pinged it to one of our producers at Look North and I said what do you think of this is this you know is there a story here um, and he said, uh, yeah, I think there is. Why don't we go and have a look? So that's what we did. Um, I went with a crew and we filmed them. Those people who we spoke to, we happened upon them. They didn't want to be face on camera because there's been lots of antagonism about people reporting fly tippers in the area. But nonetheless, it's an example of how you can use that kind of technique to, to tell a story, even without people actually fronting up on camera. And of course, once we got those people, we could then go to Barnsley Council and try and get their reaction. So that was a, a story um, which we sort of engineered out of pretty much nothing. And it also happened to coincide with the day where I was uh, presenting the programme, or co-presenting the programme. Harry was off on that day, but it was a good original story, so it, it was able to, to lead the programme. So that's the kind of thing that um, people are looking for. Certainly editors, in my experience, they want that, uh, what they call agenda-setting journalism. It was followed up in a number of uh, local uh, papers uh, over the next week, and I know my colleagues at Radio Sheffield turned into it uh, as well. So what about me then? When, when did I start uh, working? Uh, it was in the dim and distant dark days of the 1980s, so that's a long time ago, isn't it? Um, uh, there was no internet, no smartphones, no laptops, no iPads, iPods. Uh, there were no hard disk systems or broadcast journalism postgraduate certificates and degrees. None of that. Um, what we had was vinyl, 
medium wave radios and thing called, things called carts, little loops of magnetic tape in a plastic cassette to play out news reports and, uh, if you're working for a commercial station, adverts. So a very different world to the one we have now. Many more opportunities out there for you guys now, many more employment opportunities than there were when, when I was interested in uh, getting a job in, in this business. Uh, there were fewer radio stations too, I think around 40 BBC local stations or thereabouts, pretty much the same number today. There were four BBC networks and perhaps around 50 commercial stations. Um, that was across the UK. Uh, and they were local stations rather than the syndicated networks that um, we have these days where their, uh, their news bulletins are produced from a, a central newsroom um, in London or Manchester or, or Birmingham. Um, where I grew up, uh, it was in rural Suffolk. There was no BBC commercial, uh, BBC station at that, that rate, uh, and there was no commercial station either. There was uh, Look North, uh, sorry, Look East we had, and we had Anglia Television, as far as local news outlets were. Um, BBC Radio Norfolk came along in 1980, followed by the first commercial station about four years later. So how did I end up here? Um, from the age of about 10 or 11, I was always interested in in radio primarily, that was my main thing. I, I really loved the radio. Um, I used to go to bed on the night listening to uh, the football commentaries on the radio. Um, we had this lovely old wooden bush radio set. It was brown in colour, but it had a really rich tone. It was all medium wave stuff. But the commentators, uh, I can remember vividly, names like Alan Parry and Brian Butler, uh, those guys long since gone, but they were they were great voices and they were able to paint the most vivid pictures in your mind and that's what radio broadcasting is about. It's having the ability to, to paint a picture in the imagination, unlike TV where you can see it. Um, so that was a fascination for me uh, and I loved listening to the radio, it was speech radio mainly. And I would have loved to have left university like you guys and gone to work straight on the radio. But that wasn't really an option because there was nothing to aspire to, there were no local stations. So, uh, with the help of a relative who worked as a senior accounts manager at a local firm after I did O-levels, A-levels, uh, and went to co a university college, um, I left and didn't really know what to do. Uh, so I went and worked in the offices of a large engineering company, which I hated. But, I still harboured this desire to one day work in broadcasting. So I volunteered to work for a newspaper, a talking newspaper for the blind, um, which was reading uh, extracts from a local newspaper, putting them onto cassette tapes, and they were distributed to blind people in the local area. Through that, and this is where getting a break comes in, I met a guy who also volunteered, but he was the features editor of the Norwich Evening News. And we became quite good friends. and. Uh, so we both worked on that, uh, that talking newspaper for the blind for a number of years. At this time, and we're into the early 80s now, there was a commercial license advertised for the city of Norwich. And unbeknown to me, the guy who was the features editor of the Eastern Evening News had applied for a job as a producer at, uh, at this station called Radio Broadland. Uh, he got the job as the features editor for the radio station. And because of my interest in radio, which he knew about by now, and my work with the Talking Newspaper for the Blind, he said, why don't you come in and do some sports shifts on a Saturday afternoon? You won't get paid for it, but you can come in, you help out, you can compile copy, you can uh, read some of the sports bulletins if you're good enough. So that's what I did. So I used to do it on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, that led to um, one of the station managers suggesting that I might like to do what was called a, a continuity shift, uh, that was basically playing records through the middle of the night, so I was offered the opportunity to get up at 4am on a Sunday morning and play some records till 6. And I thought, shall I do it? Why not? I did, and the door by now was opening. I did that probably for about six months, and then they said to me, do you want to come and work for us full time? But, here's the difference. I was earning, in that time, in the late 80s this is, about 14,000 quid a year as a young man. Quite a decent job. The radio station offered me six and a half. Now, 
a wise man doesn't play leapfrog with a unicorn, so it sounds like a bad idea. Because I was young and a bit impetuous and daft, I said, yeah, I'll do it. So I quit the job and I went to work for the radio station. It was the best thing I ever did in my life. Because it, I was on the road now. The door was opened. And if you can demonstrate, that, well, if you can demonstrate flexibility, hard work, and some degree of ability, that's more than half the battle. So, I worked on a station in Norwich. I then, another stroke of luck, got an opportunity to move to another station in this part of the world, Radio Hallam in Sheffield. A dilemma to, to take the decision whether to move or not. I decided to do it. Uh, and once again, it proved to be another really good move because I had some great years at Radio Hallam working on programmes and on news. And there was another twist to come because after spending three years at Radio Hallam, uh, a friend of mine um, who was a presenter got his contract cancelled, which happened. So he was unemployed. One day I was leafing through a broadcast magazine and I saw an advert for a programme director at a radio station in Malta. So I phoned him up and I said, have you seen this advert for a programme director's job in Malta? I said, no. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll cut it out and I'll send it to you. So I did that, cut the advert out, sent it off to him, and he gets a call to say, we're holding interviews at such and such a time in London, in Knightsbridge, in fact, in, at such and such a date. He goes along to the interview. He phones me about four weeks later, says, guess what? I've got a job. So I thought that was great. He got a job. He was back in the business. During one half term, he phoned me and said, you fancy coming out? You have a week out here uh, in the sunshine in Malta. You can help us make some ads. We'll give you free board and lodgings. So I did that. While I was out on really a week's holiday, essentially, not getting paid for it, but not having to pay for accommodation, I met the owner of the station, a guy called Terry Bate, multi-billionaire. We had a coffee, and he made me an offer to come and read news. Once again, I thought, what do I do? I like it in Sheffield. Shall I go or shall I stay? Stick or twist? So far, I twisted a few times, and it's always paid off. So I decided to twist again. And I went and worked out in Malta for uh, just best part of a year, uh, working as a commercial copywriter, a newsreader from 6 a.m. Till, till 10, and then the second half of my shift, 10 till 2, it was writing and making the adverts for the station. It was a commercial station, a Maltese English station. So I did that. Came back home for a family wedding in, towards the end of August, and uh, I was back in Sheffield. I looked up an old friend of mine who used to, I worked with at Radio Hallam, contact. He's now working at Radio Sheffield. He says, why don't you come and have a look around here to see, see what the difference is like? Because the BBC then was very old fashioned in comparison to commercial radio. So uh, I went to see him. And basically, this, is, this, is, this wouldn't happen today. I'm sure it wouldn't really happen. They asked me if I could do a trail for them, because that's what I've been doing. So yeah, I said, yes, of course I can. I'll do a trail. I did the trail. Uh, it went out on air. Uh, and coincidentally, they had a girl called Elisa who was leaving. Uh, and they said to me, would you be up for doing some casual freelance work for us? I then had another choice to make. Shall I go back to my job in Malta, or shall I stay back here in England? Decided to stay. Once again, it proved the right thing to do, because I worked uh, as a casual employee at Radio Sheffield for three months. They then offered me a short-term contract, uh, which you'll find a lot of, lot of short-term con contracts in, in, in the industry these days. Uh, I took that, and eventually, I ended up with a staff job after having to go through the BBC boarding process, which is a, a hallmark of the way B the BBC conducts its interviews. Uh, so that's where I got to the BBC. Um, I worked in programmes. I produced uh, a guy called Tony Capstick. Anybody heard of Tony Capstick here? 
Tony Capstick's at work, he's dead now, but at the time he was a, a quite a, a, a broadcasting icon, um, very well known. If you Google Tony Capstick, you'll, you'll find out all about him. Uh, I'd been working at Radio Sheffield for about six months and they said to me, look, there's an opportunity to produce this guy, Tony Capstick. So I took the opportunity on board and that's what I did. It was a, among two and a half of the best years I had in my life working with him because he taught me an awful lot. Um, a, a natural, talented broadcaster. He came with a bit of maintenance because he liked to drink and that could prove difficult on occasions. I remember we did a feature called On Location where we would go out to a community somewhere in South Yorkshire, North Derbyshire. Every week, we'd go out twice a week um, I would record his interviews, come back and we would edit them up, or I would edit them and then we'd play them out. But I would often go around to Tony, I'd knock on his door, no answer. I'd push the door open and creep upstairs and I'd find him half laid out on his bed, he'd overslept. Anyway, we got him up, we got to our locations and we got the job done. But he did teach me one important thing about journalism and not everybody will agree with this, but it's always worked for me. He says when you talk to people, you're not interviewing them, you're having a conversation. And the thing to remember is you're asking three simple things or four or five simple things. How, why, who, when and where. Nothing more than that. I think to a certain extent that's quite true. Admittedly, you need to be briefed up on the subject. But you can, be, you can assume too much knowledge and you can over-brief yourself. So I worked with Tony. Um, I eventually came off the program and I went to Grafton House in London to the BBC uh, News Journalism School because before postgraduate journalism courses the BBC used to train people in house. It doesn't do that these days as much because there's lots of courses that are available now which is really good because you guys coming out are probably far better than people like me. So that's a great, great thing, and it's much more uh, formalised these days. After that, uh, I went up to Radio Newcastle, and then I came back to Sheffield. I did 18 months as what was called an acting broadcast journalist. I've still got the letter at home in my file. It says, Phil Bodmer, acting broadcast journalist, Radio Sheffield. So just to make sure I didn't get any high and mighty ideas about my station, I was an acting broadcast journalist. I went for many boards for staff jobs. Some were successful, some less so. But subsequently, I was successful for a board as a staff broadcast journalist at BBC Radio York. So I moved to York, and I spent five very happy years at Radio York doing a number of things. A district reporter in Harrogate, which I loved. Uh, I also worked uh, on their breakfast program for two and a half years uh, during quite a successful time because we had some big stories uh, during that time. Um, including, and you'll probably be familiar with them, uh, there were the, the floods of the year 2000 when York nearly disappeared under water. The River Ouse was at a record 18 feet above normal. And, it, and if you once again research this, you'll, you'll, you'll pick up images of Chinook helicopters and the military on the streets of York sandbagging the riverbanks. It was a great time to be working at the local station because that was one heck of a news story. And, uh, we subsequently won a, a Sony Radio Gold Award for our coverage. A couple of years later, there was the Great Heck Rail Crash. Anybody aware of the Great Heck Rail Crash? If you look at that at some stage, it was a big railway disaster in 2001. I can remember the morning of that. I was working on with the early team. I can see the clock on the wall now. I can see it in my mind. I will forever see it. About 20 past six, we had a caller uh, to the programme saying, uh, are you aware of a, a, an accident on the railways? Which we weren't. Um, but that sparked our attention a bit. So we, I was working with a colleague called Ellie. She came off air and went up to the newsroom to try and make some calls. We knew something was up because the emergency services refused to talk to us. The fire service said, we can't talk, we're dealing with a major incident. So we thought something was a bit... Something was going on. Not, we didn't know what or where. We then had another call at about 25 to 7 from a guy whose wife was on the train. She had managed to phone him and say she was in this train. It had been involved in a collision. The lights had gone out in the carriage. The carriage was off the tracks. The train was upside down. She was in the back and she'd broken her leg. So we knew something pretty substantial had happened. 
by a quarter to seven, we knew exactly where it was because we had another caller from the village of Great Heck, which is near Selby, saying to us, you better start broadcasting this because the train is a passenger train on the East Coast Main Line has collided with a coal train. Both trains are off the tracks and the mangled record is, is under the bridge right outside my house. I've got a locomotive engine in my front garden. And that turned out to be one of the biggest stories I think I've ever covered. But I can remember the morning really vividly. The next morning I went down as a reporter and stood on the bridge with the <coughs> scattered wreckage of the, the carriages, the freight wagons and two locomotives mangled. Never forget it. Quite an extraordinary uh, sight. So they were two big uh, stories that I'd covered in my days as a, a radio reporter. Um, those stories don't come along very often, but when they do, they live with you forever because they're truly extraordinary events. And uh, I'm not sure whether it's... It's not lucky to be able to report on them, but sometimes if it's a big story, you want to be part of it. And I'm sure you guys will feel much the same. If there's a big story happening, you, you want to be part of it. I've been lucky enough to work on any number of big stories in uh, my career. Uh, I moved to Look North um, in 2003, uh, I think, um, as a broadcast journalist. Um, and... It was, moving, it was doing really the less glamorous shifts, if you like. It's breakfast, producing, planning, overnights, weekends. And the editor we had at the time used to believe in something called flying hours, where you had to get time on the desk in terms of your writing to, to bring you up to speed. Uh, he, he had a philosophy that you don't go straight out on the road. You need to hone your skills. Good thing or not, uh, that's a matter of uh, debate. Um, but it helped me because it sharpened my writing up. Uh, and I did that for probably two or three years before they started letting me out as a reporter. I initially started on weekends, uh, working as a weekend reporter on Saturdays and Sundays, working with a crew. And the good thing if you work on those sort of shifts, the more antisocial shifts, if something happens, you were it. So you get the chance to to craft your skills and what it does, it places you in the shop window so the bosses can see what you can do. So that's pretty much where we are and I've done that job ever since, probably for the last probably nearly 10 years now. Uh, the presentation thing, um, it wasn't something I actively went out and asked if I could do, because lots of people do that. I had a phone call one afternoon. I was working in Bradford. I worked for two years as the Bradford video journalist. And I was coming past the Tyrrells, which is the old police station in Bradford. The phone rang, and it was my editor, Tim. And he says, Phil, got a proposition for you. How do you fancy standing in for Harry one night? And I was pretty much gobsmacked at that. And I thought, well, what the hell do they want me to do that for? But you never say no. So I said, yeah, fine. Uh, so I did it. And it went, I think it went okay. I mean, I look back at it now and it was probably pretty awful, to be fair. But I did it and actually I quite enjoyed it. And I've been lucky enough to be able to stand in for Harry over the last five years or so. So uh, the thing about presentation is it's very ephemeral and it's all subjective. And there's no rights and wrongs about who's good and who's bad because it's all about personal opinions. And all it needs is a change of boss and the whole thing changes. So. If you ever work in presentation, either radio or TV, don't let anybody ever tell you you're not up to it or you're not good enough because that's just a matter of personal opinion. Because one person thinks you're good, the next person thinks you're bad and vice versa. It's all about personal interpretation. And I would say that for most aspects of journalism, to be honest. If I read an article by a columnist in a, a national newspaper, I'll have an opinion on it. I'll think, well, that's good or it's terrible. It's just personal opinion and there's no definitive right and wrong about it, as far as I can tell. Anyway, so that's where we are. Um, recently, and I'll show you an example if I can, because uh, I'm conscious that I've been droning for a bit now, um, if I can uh, work out how to eject the blooming machine. Um, I was uh, seconded to uh, BBC Network in London. 
uh, and I spent uh, four uh, and a half, four, four months down at uh, Television Centre, uh, the old Television Centre in, in Wood Lane, which was uh, a very good experience. But um, going there as uh, somebody in, in the regions who was doing, um, you know, some, some getting to be on air, uh, it was a, a bit of a contrast. Um, you can just uh, eject that phone. Uh, yeah. Um, so it was like starting all over again because I went in on, on the night shifts, 11 a.m., 11 p.m. to 9 a.m. And I'm thinking, do I really want to be doing this, you know, working Saturdays and Sundays? Um, I didn't really relish the opportunity really that much. But based on my previous experience of doing stuff where you say yes, inevitably a break will emerge. So I've got a weekend shift. Um, and I don't know which one this is, but we'll give it a shot. Uh, there's, a big, there's a demonstration outside St. Paul's Cathedral in London. It'll come in a minute. Play, yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pause it now. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, there's a, a routine demonstration, they say. It involves some protesters at St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, I'm working with two people, a lady called Philippa Thomas, who's, who's a former Washington correspondent, and another really very capable broadcast journalist called Sarah Baldini. Um, and there's three of us working in the correspondence pool at TV Centre, and I'm thinking, well, uh, they're not going to ask me. They're going to they're get Philippa or Sarah to go on this job. They said, Phil, we're going to send you down to this protest, because I don't think they thought it was going to turn into much. It turned out to be the Occupy protest. Anybody remember those from a few years ago? It was just a routine protest to begin with. Lots of police, lots of protesters, camps, tents outside St. Paul's Cathedral. Everything was fine. It was pretty routine until it came to five o'clock in the evening where the police are asking people to move on. And the protesters say, we're not moving on. We're stopping right here. It then becomes a news story. And I'm there. Actually, it's a Saturday, you're it. So once again, it's a break, it's an opportunity. So as a result of that, for the next two or three weeks while the protest continued, I kept at the scene and I was involved in any number of packages, lives for TV and radio, and here's, I hope, just an example of what the sort of stuff we were asked the to do. The Archbishop of Canterbury was giving his first television interview about the protest taking place outside St Paul's Cathedral. He's told the BBC that the government should consider introducing a so-called Robin Hood tax on financial transactions, which would address, he says, some of the concerns over what the, the, uh, he called the protesters' moral agenda. Well, our correspondent, Phil Bodmer, is at St Paul's for us now. And uh, just tell us what the reaction has been to the Archbishop's works there. Well, yes, as you say, it's now day 18 since uh, supporters of the London Occupy, the London Stock Exchange, first began pitching tents on the uh, steps of St Paul's Cathedral. And during the last two and a half weeks, we've had any number of twists and turns in this ongoing saga. Of course, we had the resignation of the Dean of St Paul's Cathedral on Monday, the Right Reverend Graham Knowles. Last week, we had the resignation of the Canon Chancellor, Giles Fraser. And then yesterday, of course, the City of London Corporation announced they were pausing their legal action to remove the uh, tented village here at St Paul's. And then, of course, today, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr Rowan Williams, has spoken to the BBC in which he says he backs calls for a so-called Tobin tax on financial transactions. So how's that gone down with protesters? Well, let's talk to one of them now, one of the supporters of Occupy the London Stock Exchange, Dennis. What do you make of what the Archbishop has said? Does that chime with what people are asking for here? Well, I think the key thing that the Archbishop has said is that the protest here has been able to raise awareness around the moral debate. And that has been what we have been trying to do, is get the voice heard of the people who have lost their jobs, who are facing cuts to public services and to uh, the health service and education, um, and get that message heard that the 1% in society, who own 38% of the majority of wealth worldwide, um, have to share that with everyone else. I heard some of your speakers earlier on talking about dialogue and uh, lots of uh, speculation about dialogue with the City of London Corporation today. Yesterday they suspended their legal moves to evict the camp. Are you having discussions with them about the way forward now? 
My understanding is that there is a process of dialogue which is always open to everyone in this camp and we want that to end up embodying the 99% and so we are completely open to having dialogue with people of all different backgrounds around how we are going to get ourselves out of this crisis. Do you think the, the camp is likely to uh, disband though or is the move of participants here one of determination to stay off? I think it's a mixture of things. I think that there are people who very much want to be a part of this camp and want to take part in the pro protest and also want to take part in the raising of awareness that actually goes on in this camp, which is around trying to understand and raise awareness about how to overcome the economic inequalities in the financial system. However, there is huge amounts of support for this, both within Britain, in the majority of society, and also in the majority of the world when you look at the 950 occupations that are taking place. Okay, Dennis. Well, uh, supporters here say the Archbishop's comments today have furthered their aims and ambitions and uh, they believe whatever happens now they have achieved at least some degree of getting this out into uh, the public domain. Channel. And believe me, they want you to fill time. So something like that is quite handy, really. But of course, you've got to get up to speed quite quickly on the subject. Fortunately for me, because I got sent on the first day, I was able to, I was fairly across it, you see. So that was another useful tool. But that received quite a bit of prominence, that story. And if I hadn't been there on the first day, I, the chances are I probably wouldn't have de been deployed subsequently. So it goes back to take that, that moment, if you like, right place, right time. And there is an awful lot of that, I think, in journalism. Sure, you make your own luck, you make your own stories, and by working hard, it can get you into that position. But equally, there's a, there's a random uh, bit of luck in, involved inevitably in, in, in a lot of, of what we do. Um, so that's a bit of my network um, experience. Um, Look North is uh, a program I'm hugely um, proud to be part of. Um, I love uh, working for Look North. People have said to me, oh, would well, you not fancy working in London permanently? And I, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, worked down in the new broadcasting house, the newly refurbished broadcasting house down on Portland Place, and that's a superb place to, to, to do your journalism if you want, and if you're young and want to live the London lifestyle. Um, and I think if I was perhaps 20 years younger, it'd be a different proposition, but when you're married and you've got a family, uh, and your life's here in Yorkshire, which mine is and has been for the last 30 years, this is where I want to be. Uh, the other thing to remember is you work for a, a network news or a national station, and I s assume this will be much the same of some of the, the, the tabloids, the papers as well, and radio broadcasters, uh, um, you're less likely to get on. On a program like Look North, um, there's less staff, the rotors are a bit tighter, less resource, so you have many more opportunities to be able to um, uh, do broadcasting, which is uh, what I enjoy. Um, I'm very lucky. Uh, it's been a fantastic privilege to be part of Look North, and Look North's a, a huge success story. Two and a half million people uh, a week watch the programme, and I think we should be very proud for that in the multi-channel age when people are now still tuning into a, a programme that's been around for 40 years. I think that uh, says an awful lot about the appetite for uh, local news and information which I, I still think people want. Um, clearly we've got the rise now of local TV stations, um, there are community radio stations uh, and I know we hear it sometimes don't we about the demise of local newspapers, well people are sort of moving online now aren't they to get their news content online so I think the future is extraordinarily exciting and I think there are many more opportunities for uh, you guys to, to be involved. Uh, <coughs> What I would say is one of the great joys for me of journalism is that it, it hands you the keys to unlock the door to other people's lives, and I think that's a great privilege. And I think we should be extremely grateful for that, because I know I've been in situations that I wouldn't normally get access to as a, a regular citizen. Um, not many people can say they've done 120 mile, 29 miles an hour in a police car at high speed. And <laughs> That was a job I was on one night, and it's quite a, we are quite lucky to be allowed to see how other parts of life work. Uh, and there's many more working, a, you know, going down a coal mine, for instance, or uh, I was lucky enough when I worked at Radio York to fly with the RAF to Canada, to Battus, which is the British Army training unit in Suffield, and spend a week flying in a gazelle helicopter over the the planes watching tank battles. So 
it does give you these great uh, privileges from time to time. Equally, there are those moments when it can be a slog. If you're covering a heavyweight court case, and I've done a few of those, um, they can really fry the brain as well. So you, you need to be right on the money. Um, for anybody, and we'll, we can come to some questions uh, shortly, because I'm conscious I've been gassing now for 45 minutes. Uh, my advice for anybody starting out now would be always take the challenge, and you'll get plenty of challenges. Always take them. Never refuse. Be flexible, even if it's inconvenient. And don't expect to walk straight into the top job. Start at the bottom. Uh, and sometimes you might get back to the bottom quite quickly. It can happen <laughs> pretty easily in this game, I assure you. Um, I thought what we would do is I would like to end, if you could help me one more time, just end on a light note, or lighter notes, um, because, as you'll know, something, sometimes things don't always quite go to plan. Um, and I thought it might be an idea just to have a look at a few examples of things that haven't quite worked out, um, as you'll hopefully see once the... Uh, a DV player has loaded. I did intend to put these onto a laptop last night via a, a memory stick, but uh, I got back quite late on and uh, didn't really quite get the opportunity. Um, but see what you think of these. Uh, you might enjoy them. Rotherham Magistrates this afternoon. Our Crown Correspondent John Conti said this right. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. It's been a dull and dull evening for the uh, bonfire farties. Christ. I have to say that if I've got to pick an individual and they've all done tremendously well, it's got to be Jessica Ennis. Jessica Ennis. He was in an aggressive and agitated state when paramedics were called to help him. <laughs> <laughs> there were five occupants in the Saxo, both the driver and a front seat passengers. Bollocks! View shared by more mainstream building societies, the Scarborough says being a mutual organisation, we can concentrate <laughs> on rewarding our members with good value mortgages. <laughs> okay, that's got the Christmas tape done. That's got the Christmas tape done, guys. Let's, uh, you know, Penny, uh, Penny Bustin said, mm, he's a big lad, isn't he? So I just said, oh, do you really think so? <laughs> But if there's anyone who's going to break the mould, it's blur singer Damon Albarn. After all, he did create Gorillits, Gorillas, Gorillas, a virtual <laughs> group of animated characters. <laughs> like you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? I'm sorry, I just left you to it there. Yeah, uh, he's gathered 80 of the biggest names. Welcome back, Harry, in <laughs> African and Western music. Joe's older brother is quite good. There's obviously something about running in the family. Just outside the village of Spofforth and close to the entrance of Stockheld Park. Pike. Park. 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 Mental strength, belief in ourselves. Look at Jennifer, uh, Jessica Ennis. And the then Labour government thought it was time for a radical change. Looney. It is Doncaster. Well, West Yorkshire has the highest number of increased thefts, 290 this year. That's a 34%. <laughs> Our crime correspondent, John Cundy, is there for us now. John. Well, if you can hear me above the terrible noise of this jet going over, I have with me the Deputy Chief Monster of North Yorkshire, Tim Madswick. Tim, I hope you can hear me. Okay. All have been going so well. What's suddenly gone wrong? We can now go back to Harry at the Ebor in York. Harry. Healy, uh, just come with me a minute. Okay. What's your name, fella? Cole. Oh. Cole. This is this is Cole. Hi, Cole. Cole's got something to tell you. Just to, just talk down there, Cole. Oh, oh right. Hello, Keely. Just to tell you, you've been voted the lamp room sweetheart. <laughs> 
How about that? <laughs> the lamp room sweetheart. <laughs> I mean, they, there's no, what about me? No, no, you don't, you don't do it. <laughs> a decent, um, bit wank, a decent bank holiday weather-wise, some sunshine on both Saturday and Sunday. B-U-L-L-O-C-K. That's it. Fine. I, I tell you what. What? I've got a letter for the Yorkshire show and they've put my name Bollock instead of <laughs> <laughs> Right, time for a look at the weekend weather prospects now. Here's Lisa Gallagher. Oh, well, we saw a quick flash of Lisa there. I don't know whether we'll uh, be able to go back and uh, uh, bring the forecast to you. Let's hope uh, we possibly can. Here is... Uh, is she here with us? No, we can't. We can't, unfortunately. That is all from us for now. We're going back to London. Good night. I hope... Uh... <laughs> Notice too, uh, too, not too many complaints. <laughs> Live streaming, so apologies for swear words. But um, so as you can see, things don't always kind of come together quite the way they should. But uh, I suppose it always makes life interesting. But uh, thanks for your time. I hope I haven't bored you too much. It's about 50 minutes, is it? So um, if you've got any questions, feel free. If I can answer them, I will. If I can't, well, I can't. You don't have to be shy. It's fine. Go ahead, yeah. Hi. Uh, what are your thoughts on accommodation Well, I haven't come across any, and, and I, I'm not just saying that for effect. Um, I dare say it, it, it happens. Um, I don't think it should happen. I, I, it's likely. Newsrooms can be quite fractious places. Uh, I know some of your uh, colleagues or some of the, pe the speakers here would have given you sort of the kind of warts and all brief on what newsrooms can be like. Um, the thing is, you're dealing with people, you know, of, of sort of... Journalists, by their very nature, have opinions and I suppose, have egos. Uh, some of them more fragile than others. Um, I don't think there's any place for it, I, I, you know, and I would hope uh, it would be outlawed eventually. Um, I don't think it's necessarily different to... In broadcast journalism, any different to maybe other forms of journalism. Um, I don't think there's a place for it, um, but TV can be um, sometimes, uh, and it shouldn't be, but it can be a bit of a beauty contest. It's not always right. Um, and you'd like to be judged on your ability to do something rather than the way you appear. Um, certainly I would. I mean, you can tell, can't you? I mean, I'm not the world's best uh, looking, so I would hope that the reason they allow me to be on is because I have I can actually do what the job asks me to do. Yeah, well, that's a difficult one. You'd need to speak to a woman presenter about that. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because as I said earlier on, uh, in presentation especially, and my main job isn't as a presenter. My main job is as a reporter, and it's quite nice to have that in the back pocket because presentation is hugely subjective. You know. I, what you think, you think is somebody you think is a good presenter, the next person sat beside you may have a different opinion. That's, that's a difficulty. It's a very good question, very difficult one to answer, though. What's your view? Um, I, I think it does happen. Hmm. I, I don't agree with you that there's clearly no place for it. No, there isn't, um, absolutely. Yeah. No, I think you're right, and I think there is, yeah, there is, there, there is categorically no place for it, and um, you know, I would hope it, it, it you know, it, it, it wouldn't be tolerated. Certainly, if I was an editor or uh, in management, then I, I, it wouldn't be something I would want to put up with, or turn a blind eye to, for that matter. Phil, you spoke about your twist and stick approach. Yes. To yeah. Life and jobs. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, any times where you actually wished you'd stuck instead of twisted? That's a good, really good question. Um, no, there isn't. Um, I, I think I've been extraordinarily... Um, every decision I've taken, and it has been a, what, which way to go, has turned out for the best. There have been moments initially <laughs> where I thought, what have I done? I, I know when I first um, I left Sheffield to come up to York, 
and I was living in a flat and I was commuting up and down and I thought, this is poor. Equally, when I went down to London for the first time um, and I uh, had a, a, a really scabby, rented, one-bedroomed apartment in Bethnal Green with no TV, no heating, and it was in the middle of November, and I thought, dear me, do I need this at my time of life, you know? Um, and for the first few weeks, I really missed my family, and I was phoning up, and I felt a bit down. I was on these terrible overnight shifts, you know, going to work on a Sunday night at 10 to 11, thinking, what the hell have I done with my life? But as you, you saw there, it changes if you get a big job, and suddenly they think, oh, this guy or this girl can do, is okay. Because that's the thing, when you work in a big newsroom, they don't know you, and they don't trust you. They think, oh. So you've got to, a sense, you've got to prove yourself. You've got to show them that actually you can do it, or sound like you can do it, if that makes sense. Um, but once you cross that hurdle, it does open up doors, and I think that's, that's the kind of what I would wish to impart to people these days. I, I certainly would say be prepared to, I don't know how, what people think, I mean, I'm sure you guys are aware of the, the competitive nature of the industry these days. I mean, when I started out, it was much less competitive. No question about that. So I suppose people like me would never, you know, I probably wouldn't get a foot in the door these days. You know, you have to, there's many more hoops that you have to jump through now. Uh, but there are many, there are proportionally more opportunities. Does that make sense? <coughs> I was just going to ask you how easy it is to go from one day being on the radio well, it's funny, because yeah, I haven't done any radio for absolutely years. Um, and when Radio Sheffield, the editor, phoned me and said, well, my editor, Tim Smith, said to me, Phil, uh, can I have a word? And your, your heart sinks. You think, oh, God. Uh, he says, uh, an opportunity. You know, that's the word it's presented as an opportunity. Um, fancy going to Radio Sheffield to, to cover for Roni Robinson. Now, anybody who doesn't know Roni Robinson, Roni is the, equi the Harry equivalent of Radio Sheffield. He's been doing the, the same programme for 30 years. And what he doesn't know is not worth knowing. I mean, this guy is, uh, you know, he's up there with Harry. They're right at the top of their game. Uh, so it's big boots to fill. But you, you, it's a great opportunity as well. You can't say, no, I'm not going to do that. I could do it and could fall flat on my face. But even if I do, I work on the view. If I fall flat on my face, at least I gave it a shot. I gave it a try. And you haven't really lost anything by giving something a try. If you go down a cul-de-sac and it's a cul-de-sac, you turn around and come back out and carry on the, on the road. Does that make sense? That's my philosophy. <laughs> it might be flawed. But, I, you know, things have worked out. I have no regrets, um, you know. Uh, I've, as I said, I've done 21 years in the BBC. I've done 30-plus years in in this, this, this industry called broadcasting, which can fill you with enormous joy at times, and then other times you think, well, is this a real way to earn a living, you know? <laughs> so um, it's, it is a really, yeah, I would recommend it to anybody to, to have a go at, but you have to be patient, and you have, to, you have to look for the opportunities, and there's more than one route to success. So if you get knocked back, and somebody says to you, look, oh, I don't think you're up to this, you just think, well, it's only your opinion. Somebody else will think I'm all right. Um, did you find it difficult at first to adapt and learn the new technology that was coming Yeah, I find it hard all the time now. There was a time when I used to be right on the money with technology, um, but as I get older, it's becoming harder. We have these... Uh, everybody has an iPhone. I've got an iPhone on there, and, and something on here, I don't know if you said this, is called PNG which is portable news gathering. Uh, it's on my phone, it's a BBC application, so it means I could file, I could, you're filming me, I could, I could now fire this up and film you guys. And I could send that back to Look North, it would land on the server, and they could put it out like that. Thing is, I haven't used it for ages, so it will take me about an hour to work out how to do it. And, and, and it's the true of video journalism, because for four years I had a camera. Um, and a few weeks ago, I went out with my colleague Ian White. Um, there were a shortage of crews in the newsroom, and it was, we had some snow. And uh, I, I wasn't assigned to a job, and neither was Ian. Um, so they were going to send, they were trying to get a crew. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we work as a pair? I'll film, and Ian can do the reporting, which we did. But because I hadn't picked the camera up for a while, of course, I forgot to white balance. 
because on the new JVCs, there's something called FAW, which means you can, it's got an auto white balance. But I hadn't f selected the switch because I had forgotten to do that. And I was filming in the snow, which is really glary anyway. Um, so it was only when I got back, I realized it was all a bit blue. I mean, the good thing is with technology today, you can color correct anyway. But I was filming at 32 Kelvin, 3,200 Kelvin, and I should have looked on the screen and, and remembered, actually, I need to drop it into the white balance, but I didn't. So social media is the big thing. As I'm, I'm sure you will have had speakers here this week talking about social media. That's the, that's the, that's the way forward, isn't it? Um, I, I can just about keep up and make it work for me, but I dare say I'm now... I've got a foot in the camp where I'm becoming, it's, you know, I'm starting to drown, drown in the sea of technology. Um, but you can, one thing I would say is in, in, the, in the era of multi-skilling, uh, which we're in well and truly now, it's great multi-skilling because it enables you to, to do many different things. But I have yet to meet the person who's good at everything, absolutely everything. I think there's a few folks who think they're good at everything. I'm not sure I've met that person yet. So don't beat yourself up if you're not, you know, you're a great reporter, but you're not a great writer, or you're a great editor, but you're not, you, you can't shoot very well. You know, it's about being able to do as many things to a reasonable standard. Um, in that clip, you were saying you were not using that clip. What do you, what's your advice to journalists who kind of get to say more stories that aren't particularly glamorous? Uh, go, I quite like that kind of stuff. I quite enjoyed being knee deep in that stinking pile of rubbish. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course, I did phone the office and they said, have you done a risk assessment? Um, which is the same, which I hadn't, to be honest. Um, I, I did one retrospectively. Um, it's about common sense, really, you know, just use your common sense. Uh, yeah, you, there are jobs where assignments where you do have to think about your, your, your personal protection and that of the colleague you're working with. But, um, you know, and, and those rules are in place for very valid reasons. Um, but uh, doing unglamorous stuff has never bothered me. Uh, <laughs> and I know people who, I mean, because a lot of people aspire to be just presenters, you know. And that's great. If you want to do that, fine. I, I've never aspired to be just a presenter. It's great to do. Don't get me wrong. It's a great thrill to do that. But I really like being a reporter, too. And I don't mind the, the, the muckier, the better. Because I've seen some cakes have just arrived, but I hope you'll all enjoy me in giving a big round of applause to the. You're welcome.